Okay, let's do one about the Egyptian scribes, perhaps somewhat about scribes altogether. For a lot of my work deals with things that have to do with scribes, and people often overlook the concept and don't really think of how much they have to do with everything that ends up making a developed society in many, many ways. When you think of Egyptian scribes, you're probably thinking of guys that might tabble down certain things and things that they found, but that Egyptian scribe is hooked up with the artisans doing all of the major works. And after they're done, in all those temples that are done, the layer of plaster is done, and then there is an artist and a scribe working hand in hand, if not the same guy, doing work in there. And these are usually seen as Padawans, or people that are up under the major guys, but surely they're incredible. I mean, it's not the professor of the university, but he sure as hell teaches and so on. But then still at the end of every one which has that scribe's name on it, he has come back and finalized outlines and certain things to make it look just like it was before. And they pass on this knowledge from father to son in a line. So in other words, if you were a scribe, your son becomes a scribe. This type of life is really well known. I mean, this is where a lot of the Caucasian names come from that people don't even realize anymore that actually have a meaning for them, like barbers. They, they used to be the barbers, and millers used to run the mills, and so on. You know, it's, you go way off into it, but not gonna really go there. So when we talk about scribes, though, they uh, talk about them tabulating down information or copying information and sure that's true in some ways but a court reporter is copying down what's being said at that moment and sometimes it meant a whole lot it was the scribe who took down the dictation from the king himself probably after lots of consultation that's not written down about and yet the decrees written down by the ancient scribe and as they said in ancient Egyptian movies and in sayings so let it be written so let it be done and this was left upon the scribe himself to tabulate it down and surely whenever he wrote it down it was passed back to the king and the king gave a go ahead on it or maybe he even made an annotations with his other people that are with him on what not to say or what to say about it we don't know totally but one can project that idea went on and then back would be this finalized idea that they would go with that was agreed upon and in the agreement it was whatever stated Perhaps this would be on a wall, an epitaph on a statue. They probably did this for things as simple as statues and writings around on them and what they had listed around on the statue. And a pharaoh would sign off on it effectively with his seal saying that this is, you know, by him. A lot of the symbolism you see written down tells you but my master did this my master did that da, 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 and everything and my overseer for I'm just the artist that does this but hey he did this he said this he made these things happen and you can see it done in a third person point of view so it's not ever meant to be interpreted that the Pharaoh wrote this down where he goes I did this I did that he's telling you that he did this he did that and he's recording it and he records it in history and everything that goes along with these Egyptian ones but scribes everywhere the ancient Sumerians and any writing 
of the first initial people and symbolism and things that are even shown in hieroglyphs are tabulated down by these people and it's the only reason we don't have some wispy thoughts of history through at least this time. When we talk about history and it really dies at recorded history because they don't know. No, we know a whole lot more now and things stretch back as far as Gobekli Tepe and much farther and I'm showing a lot of those in my videos but like, share, and subscribe and you'll see a lot of those. But let's get into this for this is really describing one as many, if you will. So let's just pick one out of the group that's well known. But he's unknown, for he is known as the seated scribe. The sculpture of the seated scribe or squatting scribe is famous work of ancient Egyptian art. It represents a figure of a seated scribe at work. And again, you can see that listed through all time of people tabulating things down whether it be on scrolls or what and quite often probably things are done on scrolls and then put into stone for all time and we're lucky it's done that way too for stone means so much and I don't want to go off on just simple aspects like that but it's lucky that they preserved themselves in the way that they did for us to finally figure it out years later and things that's hidden nowadays people don't really get readily known the sculpture was discovered at Saqqara it's uh, north of the valley of the Sphinxes leading to the Serapium of Saqqara in 1850 and dated to the period of the Old Kingdom from either the 5th dynasty or the 4th dynasty so somewhere in the 24 to 2600 BC range there's a lot of people that say this exact statue would have fit right in the middle of that somewhere and so they can't necessarily date it and don't have a name on it. This is the unknown soldier. This is the unknown scribe. Quite often you'll see it listed as Kai. In a minute I will show you who Kai really is or who they profess that Kai is and so we can tell that they're definitely not the same because they do something special to these or you think it's special to these Egyptian scribes and they draw them somewhat realistic whereas the Pharaoh is always drawn in a certain way and never fat never this never that scribes are drawn much more realistically man that's never seen again from the very first statues here until say Akhenaten's time but then he isn't really drawn realistic he's drawn in a character and exaggeration showing a belly and things like that that really can't be quite accurate but these statues some of them especially look quite accurate and there's quite a few of them that are kept from the earliest of dynasties uh, this one in question is now in the Louvre Museum in Paris it's painted limestone statue the eyes are inlaid with rock crystal and I've done a video just about these rock crystals because it's this upart on how did they make these lens looking crystals for eyes way back when. It's not just a smoothed off area of rock but they've used clear crystals and they did all this thing to make it look like a realistic eye. We'll look at one in just a moment. They use this magnesite and it's magnesium carbonite but it's a special rock that they found that has little pink lines in it and by picking out the certain chunk and making it the wide area around the eyes it makes it even more realistic. So it's something that is so realistic you don't see it necessarily in Greek statues as well as they look. And they were painted somewhat, but they didn't have these crystal in their like eyes and stuff. You know, one critique of Egyptian statues is they're always in this stepping forward and in this one certain pose and things like that. Whereas Greek statues were in motion showing musculature and things like that. Of course it's... You think it's got to be exaggerated. Everybody was built like hell back then, but what else did they have to do but live life? And life back then was hard. So um, it's painted limestone statue inlaid with rock crystals, that magnesiite, and then a copper arsenic alloy. Now, arsenic alloy is what was used to make copper even harder. And we'll talk about somebody named copper here shortly too. Some people believe that that's where the name comes from. Others say, well, Cyprus and 
its mines in Kapros, and that's where copper comes from. Meh. And uh, they had nipples made of wood. Basically, they drill into them and cut off a little piece of dowel rod and shove it in and make it look like a nipple of wood. In fact, before we get any farther, let's just go ahead and take a look at these and see what this looks like. This is the unknown, or what's known as the sitting scribe. And uh, so he's sitting here in a pose and holding a piece of rolled up scroll and ready to write. There's no pen anymore, but he's very attentive, paying close attention, and you can kind of see those weird crystal eyes that they've been set that are blue for the earliest of Egyptian dynasties and stuff or blue-eyed Caucasians, as you see here. They have uh, one oddity of this is that they follow you around the room somewhat until you get about at this angle but also they have a looking of gray to them at certain angles and then they go blue especially when you're looking head on at them you can almost see the gray bottom to this lens and in a lot of the pictures you'll see where they don't look so blue you can just step a little to the left of this and it'll be gray and around but then it starts to follow you around the room like ancient painting so this is somewhat the close-up if you will of it here's a close-up of him and his laid out papyrus ready to write his stance which is cross-legged and somewhat buddha like for a reason being attentive straightened spine all these situations but you can see he's kind of thick got a little bit of man boobs and you can see his profile here and how he looks very attentive like he's ready for you to start speaking and he's going to start writing it down or he's waiting for the inspiration that will come out of certain things like studying ancient uh, sacred geometries and stuff like that that was going on well into this time I'm about to go into a little series of videos about sacred geometry and who knew it when and so on and why are we, where and how is it utilized and this is some of the secrets of the Masons of old that aren't really taught about anymore but anybody that's into woodworking or stoneworking uses these same principles and you wouldn't believe how much you might utilize geometry on a daily basis you're looking from the back a little thick and a real close-up of that showing his fingernails and the outlines and everything about it ready to go there's nothing written on this but there may have been at one time and uh, you'd think it'd be real neat if there would be the starting of a ancient tale that everybody knows and he's stopping in midpoint here but it can't be about one moment for he did many things here's another depiction of one and this is another common depiction a little less used here is instead of in writing pose he's in reading pose where he's unrolling the scroll and able to read it out to you and tell you what it means and so on people would get letters back then and the common public wouldn't be so literate and they would seek out friends or somebody that knew or perhaps a scribe and uh, there's another picture of the hands so let's go back to this here and get this description of him and I'll try to keep it centered, right? This painted limestone sculpture represents a man's seated position, presumably a scribe. The figure is dressed in a white kilt, stretched to his knees, like you see in all the arts and stuff. And they, they wore kilts. It's holding a half-rolled papyrus. Perhaps the most striking part of the figure is its face. Its realistic features stand in contrast to perhaps the more rigid and somewhat less detailed body, and also in contrast to depictions of pharaohs, where they're always drawn somewhat idealistic. But there are pharaohs that have these crystal blue eyes. We'll look into that shortly, too. But it's only in the earliest of dynasties, and that's one of the parts that made it an ooh part, is why would they have something so cool and have lost it? And it seems around about the 12th dynasty and first intermediate period and coming out of that, they no longer did this thing. And it's rarely used again. Only do you see it left in the one eye that's left in Nefertiti 
and uh, that's really about it. His hands, fingers, and fingernails of the sculpture are delicately modeled. Hands are in a writing position. It seems that the right hand was holding a brush. It's now missing. The body is sturdy with a broad chest. The nipples are marked with two wooden stubs. And there's a thing of magnesite chemicals that are used. But they were using ones that had a pink vein into them. Special attention was devoted to the eyes of the sculpture. They are modeled in rich detail out of pieces of red veined white magnesite in the whites of the eyes, which are elaborately inlaid with pieces of polished truncated rock crystal. That blue crystals you're seeing. The backside of the crystal is covered with a layer of organic material, which at the same time gives color to the iris and serves as an adhesive. Um, I did a video about this, and uh, that's not exactly the way that it works for the, the crystals have a little appearance to them anyhow and then the way they make the reflector behind it it makes it stand out and look like an eye and then there's still a dark spot in it and they put it in a near exact distance behind it and because you're looking through a lens it gives you a look that you're looking into a real eyeball with that lens and the iris behind it and it's quite a feat but uh, Interesting also, two copper clips hold each eye in place. So they have carved out the statue's eye and then set it in with this where it has the lapis lazuli looking outline and stuff, but quite often that's just done in that copper all the way around it. And it's oxidated to almost look like lapis lazuli now. The eyebrows are marked with fine lines of dark organic pigment and you always see these thick eyebrows and stuff and all the Egyptian art showing that situation. Um, the scribe has a soft and slightly overweight body suggesting he's well off and does not need to do any for sort of physical labor. He sits in cross leg position that would have been his normal posture at work. His facial expression is alert and attentive, gazing out to the viewer, viewer as though he is waiting for them to start speaking. He has a ready-made papyrus scroll laid out on his lap, but the reed brush used to write is now missing. Both of his hands are positioned on his lap, his right hand pointing towards the paper as if he is ready to, uh, if he's already started to write while watching the other speak. He stares calmly at the viewer with his black outlined eyes, but if we look at the eyes, uh, they've corroded and gotten that copper patina that all looks bluish green but they at one time were riddled with or rubbed with coal even though this is made of copper and then those blue crystal eyes and you can almost see that lens effect that I'm talking about and how they put the little dot in the center of it and uh, to look at him head on it's quite the thing and just any of these people that found you know first saw it said that it was somewhat haunting that it was like the uh he follows you around the room and it's like he has real eyes it's a sculpture that has real eyes the sculpture of the seated scribe was discovered at saqqara in november of 1850 on the 19th actually to the north of the serapium's line of sphinxes that you see lined up in the sphinxes with the aries ram's head by french archaeologist augustine mariette the precise location remains unknown as the document describing these excavations was published posthumously, meaning after his death, and the original excavation journal has now been lost. The identity of the person represented remains unknown. The semicircular base of the sculpture suggests that it was originally fitted in a larger piece of rock which presumably carried its name and title but that's now all lost. This somewhat unusual uh, pose, it seems reserved for members of the immediate royal family, although not for the king himself. You don't see the king as a scribe, although the king would have been able to read and so on in verified every case.
and he would have been taught many things, but the scribe would have been taught many things more than just how to read and write. He would have been taught all of the religious aspects and know the connotations and everything about it and also pretty much what he was supposed to write, the way it was said, the way it was done, the way it was done before, the way it continues to be done and so on. So immediate royal families passed down princes that weren't the king would be scribes. So basically everybody was taught as a scribe but you don't see a king as one. Right? For he was going to be the king. This statue was dated to the period of the 4th dynasty, which is 2600 to 2500 BC, so just right coming into the time of the pyramids, who we'll get to shortly on the scribe that is shown for that actual architect of the pyramid. It is usually associated to the person of pen Hernefer, and when you look that up, it's a high official who held reigns under the pharaohs Huni and Senefru in between the time of the end of the third dynasty and the beginning of the fourth dynasty. And I agree and concur that it could be him, but also they've took a series of 20 names, more than 20 names, and narrowed it down to six or eight. And out of that, they think it's probably this one. And you know, does it matter? Well, maybe it does. And if you could find any other depictions that looked more non-stylized of this man, then you'd probably get a good idea of which one he is. But they don't have too many depictions of him for this was his statue. It's a great honor to have one. Certain stylistic characteristics that are uh, absent and normal things are found there like unusually thin lips, the broad chest, having some man boobs, the posture of the torso might support this theory. But, and what they're saying there is, you know, whenever you're sitting there, when you're standing up, you won't necessarily have man boobs and so on, but you can sit there and whenever you do, you'll get a little winch on your belly and you get a little sag and so that makes that somewhat show up. But that's not necessarily true. Most people are saying, no, they probably draw this more accurate to a reality. And look at me, I'll take off my shirt and I sit down like that and yeah, looks like that. Certain stylistic characteristics though show up. Dating itself remains uncertain. The period of the sixth dynasty has also been suggested. So all the way from the third to the sixth, one additional fact in favor of the earlier date is that the statue is represented in writing position while it seems that scribes from the period after the 5th dynasty have been trained mainly in reading position as the other one I showed you. So all through this dynasty though all these statues are shown with crystal blue eyes. There's like 18 of them that have been found and there's a few pharaohs and so on in there so it's extremely dominant and it shows you the genetics of the people that started off ancient Egypt. The seated scribe was made around 24 to 25, 35 BC that they say now through that one so they're cutting off that other one, other dynasty that it could have been. It was discovered near a tomb made for an official named Kai and is sculpted from limestone. Now they, they say this but in a minute I'm going to show you who Kai actually is and his scribe statue and that's not the same guy as you can distinguish between them because they are not drawn all the same. You know, it's not plug and play with a different name on it. And sadly, a lot of the pharaohs are. Many pharaohs and high-ranking officials would have their servants depicted in some form of image or sculpture so that whenever they went to the afterlife, they would be able to utilize their skills to help them in their second life. They need that wisdom there. They need that person there. He's extremely important. Every bit of literature that you see around on the walls and everything are done through these people. The scribes were um, some of 
the very few who knew how to read and write, they say, and were highly regarded and well paid. Most people were peasant farmers who had no need for literacy, although some members of the royal family and high status individuals, well as officials, priests, army officers were literate. Scribes were needed for operation of state and at all levels, usually shown as males here, but also the Temple of Hathor is well known for writing things back and forth and so on, and so there would have been women, definitely, that were scribes also in that time to be able to go through all of the other things. So scribe is not just something where, okay, you're a court reporter, you're the scribe. It's not the way it worked. There were a lot of them from the point of architecture through the statuary and symbolism working close and hand in hand with the people that were the sculptors if not the sculptor themselves and so on. Scribe were used for a multitude of things in, uh, involving everyday Egyptian life. They would be used as tax collectors, were in charge of organizing personnel for activities such as mining, trades, war. Scribes were also used to work on projects like pyramid building, temple building, and so on, and help communicate between the rulers and the Egyptian people. So they were quite the go-between. You didn't really get to see the big man very often. And so there's a list of ancient Egyptian scribes that we could look at that's quite extensive. They have very few pictures of any of them listed onto it there. So better yet, let's see who that Kai was. And uh, we're going to see Zahi Awas talk about whenever he originally found the statue of Kai. So here's the statue of Kaaper, K-A-A-P-E-R. And uh, that looks like my dad. He's got blue crystal eyes too. And all these early statues are wood statues. And uh, there's a famous one of Hor Aha, if I get a chance to show it to you. And all these things were kept in crates. And uh, much as the way as you think of the ancient ideals of uh, how somehow in uh, in the Smithsonian they took them away and logged them away in this odd area. And so it's telling you a story here that they found somebody that was a tomb robber and they took this uh, tomb robber and put him in jail and they whooped his ass until he told him where it was and uh, so here is the actual tomb itself high priest, a scribe and a man who performed temple rituals but there was more so you can see it looks very much like all the other Egyptian Behind stuff. Behind that door, we found the statue of this guy. Maybe it is the most impressive private statue ever found in Egypt. And he tells you it may be the most impressive one of all those that they found. A little smaller than some of the other rest and everything, but it's done so well. And uh, so now they're going to show him having gone to try to go pick up the actual statue itself at this site that's locked up here that's up in Saqqara and bring it to the Today, Dr. Zahi has come back to collect him I remember when I found this statue my eyes came and yours would too. At this angle, you're getting a gray, right? I'm getting a gray, blue gray, but gray. And you can even see the little dot inside of it. But it's really blue, and you'll be able to tell here in a minute. But he said whenever he found the statue, it was the most beautiful thing he's ever seen. Of course, after watching a bunch of Zahi Watts things, I think he said that about 10 or 12 times. It's very exuberant. Let's continue. To look at the eyes of this statue. It was the most beautiful moment in my life. Most beautiful moment in his life. And let's see if I can get to it here. There's a 
some little statues and these dolls that went with it and other things and here they are cleaning it off and they used acetone to clean it but real mild acetone there I can get the whole thing in there pretty much acetone that won't harm the delicate colors yeah discovered inside a tomb at the Baharia oasis this child mummy had lain unseen for 2,000 years so there's a child and his effigy and stuff not done as a pharaoh just a, a common person but he must have been with some group of nobility or royalty in some way shape or form and his little death mask and uh, you know they find these tombs and things are just a wreck and it's hard for them to slowly figure out what it comes out to in this little presentation they've got they figured it all went to a chair and off the little pieces they had they said well this was darkened wood and this other stuff and they had all the symbology and it makes sense if they put them in these order and it's the king's names that are there so pretty neat and uh, chairs and amazingly they show this one chair and it just looks like the Elizabethan England stuff with a little lion paw feet and the whole nine yards on it but here they are trying to rebuild one and it's out of all these little pieces of gold leaf and little pieces of different types of stone that are all inlaid on it and uh, these guys come in and they start getting pictures of just weird things ooh good I was able to get this it's like the only time you ever see this right here it's a weird statue of a lion concept see that pretty weird but they find Shabti dolls and stuff and they find mice and they're like what well it's in a temple to Horus and that's actually something you give a hawk and all of these pieces that are from King Tut's burials and stuff. Let's see. Ten Commons. Magnificent jewelry will be included in the Centennial Show. And I couldn't stop it, but that bottom right scarab down there, the center stone that's in it, is made out of that molten Libyan glass from an asteroid impact that happened long, long ago. Quite neat. And uh, Tutankhamun's mask and so on. <coughs> Let's see if I can go ahead and screw through here to, uh, well, there's a researcher guy telling you that the blue eyes tells you significant things and blah, blah, blah. And here's the redone sculpture that they're taking in. And that little picture a second ago was the place it's supposed to go. And they're about to place it. 4,000 years after he was laid to rest beside the pyramids, it's time for Kai, Dr. Zahi's favorite to reach his final destination. Hey, Said to be his favorite. It's a special moment for Dr. Zahi. And you can see it if you go into the museum to this day, but it's in a different position for they've made the new museum, you know, that's there. But, yep, those crystal blue eyes those amazing Caucasian Egyptians. Now let's go uh let's go look at ooh giraffe culture. There's the seated scribe again, but let's uh let's go to something that actually shows this guy was utilized in some depiction. I'm gonna stagger it a little bit for clarity's sake, but the type of work that scribes would do is things like this too, and he describes how he has to do all the drawings and know the flight shape of birds and people in position and males and female postures and hippopotamuses, but also there are secrets to their special paints that only they know, and he doesn't really talk about it, but he mentions and he mentions his qualifications. Behind this immense creative output lies an essential figure. The man who with a simple sharpened reed or brush gives birth to all Egyptian art. And this is the guy we were just looking at, the unknown. And he might have been that name 
pen, that started with pen. And uh, it's a possibility, but you can look at it as being the symbol of the earliest of Egyptian scribes. Sure, a lot of them they know the name of and just say, yeah, you know what? A lot of this cool stuff that was done way back when was also done by this man. You don't know his name, but he deserves the damn medal too. In fact, people give no credit to scribes. It's kind of my point that I was getting at there, that uh, scribes don't get no love, man. But they also can show you much about the ancient Egyptians for everything we know about the Egyptians came through a hand in the mind of a scribe engraved on a stele found in Abydos one of these men appears seated next to his wife and for anyone who knows how to read the hieroglyphs engraved on the stone he himself describes his qualifications written in the ancient hieroglyphs possible he did his own tomb but a lot of people think that no it would have been done by someone else someone well known well known scribes even though they teach would have been ones that are selected to do certain things and even pharaoh's tombs temples things like that not necessarily to do all of the work for that's done by some of the Padawans. We're still are well high ups. Let's continue and here's qualifications. I know how to estimate dimensions, recut and fit until an element is in place. I know the posture of the male statue and the appearance of the female, the attitude of the 11 birds of prey, the arm movements of a hippopotamus hunter and the leg movements of a running man. That's quite an impressive list. But he's not listing everything. And there's more. I know how to make pigments and products that melt without fire burning them, and that moreover are insoluble in water. Which is an incredible feat. This is dedicated to one of the scribes, and this is the cartouche who he's under, and the pharaoh he was under during the time of him doing work. This could have been used exactly in those places. You see Egyptian blue in the front right one, and it just ironically looks like those little kids' paint deals that we have, and those little blots of paint filled up areas. But they're not really using that palette yet, and blotches around on it like Bob Ross and stuff but they have them down in little sections for using them although black is used quite a bit and the red ochre color in fact the red ochre color that you see on there is very symbolic in many Caucasian arts that you see of through the whole era of all this you see red ochre males and pale females that can be seen in the Minoans and the Etruscans and the Mitanni people and the Greek art themselves you see quite often those back and forth and there's a symbology with it and so on and sometimes you see black statues in here and they it's called a Ka statue and it's the symbol of, of Osiris and death and then rebirth and so on nobody will know of this except me and my eldest son the God having ordered that he become an initiate this describing the fact that he passes it down to his eldest son and so on and so on and we know of the lineages now and how people were attached to each other somewhat distantly at times other times not now but keeping it within a ruling class of family somewhat and we see that even showing up in England and Europe much later and so he's just one of the many scribes of ancient Egypt but there were lots of them and you can imagine in these first earliest dynasties these people here shown with their blue eyes that eventually over time there would have been quite a few shown so all this little art that's been done by them is run by 
probably a handful of major ones through each little era and each little dynasty. Some of them are known. Some of them even got statues done to them because they knew of how great they were and what it meant so much. But as it got on later and it was something that was well accepted and writing was a normal thing and the ability to do what they did, although it's still praised, now in a modern day and where everybody can write now, having been brought writing to the world from the ancient Sumerians and Phoenicians that we get our writing from and have passed that around, other people making their own, we kind of think lighter of it than probably the amount of levity that can give to somebody that did so much. So let's look at one more before we go back and finish with it. And I'm about to hit 45 minutes, so I'll try to do this quick. Let's just click on one of these pictures. This is him winning. He is the architect of the Great Pyramid. Son of, grandson of King Senefru of the Fourth Dynasty. There's no information about how many wives and children he had. He was a vizier during the reign of his uncle Cheops and credited for having been the architect of this king's pyramid. He's shown a little bit of man boobs too and stuff. Sitting down, not cross-legged, but this way. More an architectural style, I'm guessing here, but you can tell by looking at him. And uh, so he's a, it's an impressive lifestyle statue, which is uh, fairly tall, well, one and a half meters tall, but sitting. He would have been over six foot tall, found in a niche in of his mastaba. It represents him when he seated on a block throne his hand right decisively clenched, his left hand resting on his knee. His body is heavy, perhaps an indication that Himenu was rather fat, or perhaps an indication that he was well-to-do and didn't have to do so much work. The statue's head had been restored and has been damaged around his eyes, which originally may have been inlaid with mountain crystals. This is what we're talking about again. The statue is one of the many exhibits in the Museum of Hildesheim, Germany, and people don't even rarely get to see this one. Did you know there's a real cool museum in Hildesheim, Germany where they dug his eyes out and now it's been replaced. But they may have been those crystal eyes from before. So we hit 44 minutes, guys, and I haven't gotten to the very end of what they say even about the, uh, oop, went right past it. For it was right there, the seated scribe himself. But like, share, and subscribe and enjoy. And we'll go on further. We can look at many top topics uh, attached to this. Peace.